When you are working on a cover, Robert, like what is that typically like for you as the artist? Is that a separate note? Is that, you know, if you're working on something from, we'll talk about it from like a publisher basis and then we'll talk about it from a creator own basis. Yeah, of course. Um, because I think they are very different. That's a good point. I think uh, the, for, for covers, I, the way I talk about it in my classes is I break it down into three main types. You could have a story driven cover that is there to push the question, what's going to happen in this book. Yeah. So when you see the characters on the cover, they're somehow depicting what's going to happen in the book. It's usually somehow representative of a plot point. Uh, then you can have an iconic cover, which you look at it and it's just the character doing what typically is like Batman standing on a gargoyle. You're like, that <laughs> is Batman. Yeah. You know, right? Uh, it's Spider-Man swinging through Manhattan, something like that. And you just know that that is iconic for that character. Or you could do something that is symbolic, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be figure based or representative uh, of that figure, but it is uh, somehow symbolic of what either what's going to happen or what the tone of the book is about. It's like the by the Superman symbol bleeding on the death. Of exactly, Superman. yeah. So <laughs> very symbolic, right? So, but yeah. do you get that as a note, or do you get that as does it depend? Like, does when a publisher be like, hey, for this cover, we're really thinking the splash or you know like you you did this thing maybe we could blow that out as a plot point or um, sometimes, sometimes it kind of yeah it depends um whether it's a, a certainly a number one issue you definitely yeah. don't want to typically do a story based yeah uh, cover because people don't know the story yet right yeah. so you want to do like on elder delusion here it's our variant cover yeah. it's very iconic it's these characters looking cool doing what they do right? yeah um so that's always best for a number one cover, typically. Until we know these characters, we don't want to get into story. So yeah. our covers for the first arc are very iconic, you know, I would say. Um, then, uh, but I think of like symbolic covers, you do want to give variety. I bring classes here and I have them look at the wall of covers mm -hmm. and it becomes a gallery. And I talk to them about yeah. which covers stand out. And it's not these busiest covers, right? No. It's usually the ones that are of a limited color palette. There's less going on. And usually it's the more symbolic covers. Yeah. Or um, the more single figure covers or something like that. Or um, sometimes even I, I end up referring to them as gimmick covers, which isn't always appropriate. But it's the ones that are like your negative space sure. or using silhouettes. Yeah. Or, a lot of high contrast because yeah. that is what pops when you look at a wall, especially exactly. the superhero poses and action sequences and all of that. And that could be great. I mean, you could certainly do that as a theme for every one of your issues, yeah. but usually it's good to break up every few arcs or every few issues with one of those just to uh, just to kind of build a rhythm of what people expect and to help yours stand out from the rest. And that's kind of where the variant cover industry yeah, comes in. Sure. Is like, oh, let's do this one-off iconic yeah. or this artist's interpretation mm -hmm. of this character. That has absolutely nothing to do with what's inside <laughs> no, yeah. the book. Yeah, the one, time <laughs> no. that, the one time that came back to bite me is I did a variant cover on G.I. Joe uh, where we were doing an homage to the Crisis mm -hmm. cover of yeah. Superman holding uh, Supergirl. Yeah. And I had Duke holding Scarlet, like, uh, oh. hanging in his arms. And, and all the drugs, everyone's like, Scarlet's dead? I'm like, no, oh. it's just an homage cover. Like, everybody freaked out online. I'm like, no, it's, <laughs> it's nothing idea, to do. It? No, they asked me to do it. So uh, they're, yeah. they're like, hey, he can you so. do this uh, Crisis homage? I was like, sure. And then they loved it. They're like, can you do another one with Cobra characters? I'm like, you realize I drew 50 characters on this cover? I'm like, oh, we so know. I did it again. Yeah, no, no, no. They totally <laughs> so I did one for the Cobra. But you had to sell those originals, right? You did oh, those for oh, yes, right? Did. Okay. <laughs> Good. Heck yeah, I did. Yeah. So then Good I did one for the Cobra book, and then I did one for the Snake Eyes. Yeah. So I did three versions. Wow. Was he holding his wolf? No, I was shut up! Oh my god! Oh, this is such a big opportunity! Where were you 10 years ago? I know, I know. My limited knowledge of Snake Eyes, I know he has a wolf. <laughs> he just kind of a timber. Timber, timber. Oh, yeah. Oh, what's he, holding? Uh, he wasn't holding anybody, actually. Uh, he, <laughs> Helix was knocked out, lay, laying down over the rock, and he was turned in to shoot a Zuzi at somebody. Uh, so we did a more action based one. Uh, he's like, so much for Helix. And he was like, oh. <laughs>